Hello, everyone. My name is John Adler, and I'm here to talk about fuel and scaling Ethereum with optimistic rollups. So let's start with a brief introduction about myself. I'm currently with Fuel Labs, where we're building Fuel, a high-performance optimistic rollup chain. Previously, I was working at Consensus as a layer two scalability researcher, and I created the optimistic rollup design paradigm from that research. So let's talk a bit about the scaling problem, first of all, since obviously, you know, optimistic rollups are supposed to scale blockchains. Bitcoin can do between three and seven transactions per second. Ethereum can do somewhere around 15. Or if we're just considering simple payments, it's more like 30. And meanwhile, Visa can handle 10,000 plus transactions per second at peak capacity. And we would like to increase this number. We'd like to increase transactions per second or throughput without decreasing decentralization or acquiring new trust assumptions. Obviously, it's pretty simple. If we just you know, trust Visa to process all our payments correctly, then we don't need a blockchain. So we'd like to you know, not insert new trust assumptions. And I said throughput before, which is not exactly scalability. So scalability is throughput divided by decentralization. It's, it's the ratio. And what exactly do we mean by decentralization? Let's, get, let's, let's find out. So first, let's see, what is the scaling bottleneck? Uh, one common talking point is that, for example, uh, EOS is more scalable than Ethereum because it's centralized around 21 block producing nodes. And you might see graphs like you see over here, you know, EOS has 21 block, producer, block producing nodes with approximately even distribution of some, some civil resistance control mechanism. And meanwhile, Ethereum and Bitcoin have, you know, six mining pools, five mining pools that control the majority of the hash rate, which seems odd because if, if the number of nodes had anything to do with the transaction throughput, then you would expect Ethereum and Bitcoin to support more transactions per second than EOSs. So it's wrong that the number of nodes has anything to do with throughput. Why? Because consensus is not the bottleneck. So let's see what decentralization is. On Ethereum, we want a non-consensus full node with approximately these hardware specs, a four core CPU, eight gigabytes of RAM, and an NVMe SSD. That should be able to fully validate the chain at a rate approximately 30 times as fast as it grows. In other words, it's able to catch up when it's doing an initial block download. On Bitcoin, our specs are we want a non-consensus full node to run on a Raspberry Pi and a hard disk drive, and that must be able to validate the chain at a rate approximately 100 times as fast as it grows. And in EOS, we want a non-consensus full node with some absurdly high specs that are right here, let's say 64 core CPU, one terabyte of RAM and so on, uh, and it must fully validate the chain approximately one times as fast as it grows. Uh, so you can't really catch up after, after if you drop off. Uh, so in other words, decentralization is measured by the cost to run a full node. It is not the number of full nodes or the number of nodes in general, let, let alone full or not. Uh, and this is a social contract. Uh, you know, every blockchain has a social contract of how much it should cost to run a full node. And it has nothing to do with consensus. So let's see how Ethereum scaling bottleneck compares to Bitcoin. How does it manifest? Uh, why can, despite the fact that, you know, the, presumably you can say the decentralization of Ethereum is less because the cost of a full node is much more than Bitcoin's, why is it that Ethereum can only do twice the TPS? You can do 15 to Bitcoin 7. And the answer is that it's because of EVM execution. Uh, you can do much more complex smart contracts on Ethereum than you can do in Bitcoin. Uh, and the second thing is, and this is the, the big one, is state accesses and state growth. So the Ethereum uncompressed state size is approximately 60 gigabytes nowadays. This can't fit in RAM, therefore you have to put it on an SSD, ideally an NVMe SSD, which means you're going to have very large, very long access times. Uh, Bitcoin state, the UTXO set is approximately three gigabytes, give or take. Uh, so this is kind of where the biggest, the biggest problem comes in. This is why Ethereum can't do that many more transactions per second, despite having much higher hardware requirements to run a full node. So how can rollups help solve this particular bottleneck? How does it, how does it target this particular bottleneck? The rollup design paradigm is essentially you do state accesses and execution off chain, and you only use the base Ethereum chain for data availability and ordering. 
and then you ensure that the validity of this data that you're just posting on chain, you can ensure that it's valid using one of three methods. One is a validity or zero knowledge proof. So this is ZK rollups. The other one is fraud proofs plus a timeout. And this is optimistic rollups. And the third is an interactive verification game plus a timeout. And this is what teams like Arbitrum are doing. So why can rollups scale? And there's a star here, which we'll discuss shortly. So with rollups, the consensus nodes, like miners and so on, and also non-consensus nodes, so users, only need to make data available in order. They don't have to execute transactions. And this is great because you can't have less execution than no execution. Uh, just ordering transactions is basically the optimal amount of work you can do, which is not, not, there's nothing, right? You're not executing anything. You're just ordering the transactions. Uh, so now where does the can come in from? Where does the can come in? Uh, you might have seen interesting, interesting numbers like this. You know, you have a 10 million uh, gas, gas limit per block. You know, each transaction in the raw, let's say it's aggressively 100 bytes. That's actually quite large. It can be much smaller. You know, the, the gas cost of call data is 16 gas per byte, and you have a 12-second block time. This gives you 500 transactions per second. And you can, you, you can look around the internet, and you see many estimates of this. Uh, but this isn't exactly correct. Why? Because if everything, everyone was just using, you know, let's, let's consider a thought experiment. If everyone was using a single EVM optimistic rollups, then that wouldn't increase scalability. We wouldn't be able to fit more transactions per second if we want to maintain the same hardware requirements and we want to maintain the same rate at which we can catch up. Uh, we would still be limited to 15 transactions per second with a single EVM rollup. Uh, some other gotchas, and there'll be a, a few more gotchas in the slide. Uh, you might have seen, you know, comparisons like this, where you know zk rollup, the producers of the rollup have to do a lot of work, but verification is very cheap because you just have to verify a succinct proof. You don't have to, you know, fully execute every transaction. And in an optimistic rollup, if you want to be safe, if you don't want to add additional trust assumptions, you do need to fully validate every transaction. Hence, why the previous slide we said. An EVM optimistic rollup does not result in additional throughput without trade off somewhere else. And you know, on the on the surface level, it seems reasonable that you know this is what this is this is what validity proofs do. They allow you to prove some exponentially more expensive thing and you know exponentially less work. Uh, but this isn't exactly true. Uh, this is not sufficient. Because what happens if all the rollup block producers just go offline and then no one is around to give me a Merkle branch, a Merkle proof that I need to withdraw my coins or to further transact on the rollup? Then what I have to do is apply every single state transition from the rollup's genesis. And it turns out that, let's say, simple balance transfers, you know, Alice just transfers some money to Bob, that's basically 99% just state transition. There's basically no computation being done there, just a simple comparison, which is trivial. Uh, so it turns out that in ZK rollups, it is not sufficient to just validate the validity proof. You also, in the worst case, and therefore you must met metric your system based on this worth worst case. In the worst case, you must apply every single state transition from Genesis, uh, and that is not exponentially cheaper. Uh, so because of this, Validity proofs only scale pure computation with no side effects. They do not scale the number of state transitions. And if you're just comparing, you know, simple Alice transfers to Bob state transitions, then using validity proofs does not provide any additional scalability compared to, for instance, full validation compared to optimistic rollups. Okay, so let's talk about the now. I spend a lot of time, you know. T telling you why optimistic rollups and rollups in general don't provide scalability, uh, or in what cases they don't provide scalability. But you know, let's talk about now how they can provide scalability. What are the, what are some benefits of optimistic rollups? So we note uh, that sharding increases throughput by allowing you to execute uh, many uh, parallel execution threads. Well, you can run many parallel execution threads. If you have 64 shards, you're running 64 execution things in parallel. Uh, and as long as you don't need to fully validate all of them, like if you just you just care about one shard, then you can get some decent scalability gains from there. Within a single shard, you don't get scalability, but you can run multiple of them in parallel. And it turns out you can do the same thing with rollups. They allow dynamic heterogeneous sharding. 
uh, which is dynamic because you, the number of shards can vary. It's not fixed by consensus, right? You can run as many rollups in parallel as you want. And it's heterogeneous because each rollup can be different. And this brings us to our second point. Optimistic rollups allow you to explore different execution and data models without hard forks to the base chain. And different execution and data models potentially allow for more throughput with the same node hardware requirements. For example, you can have a UTXO based chain, and this is what we're doing at Fuel Labs. You can have a custom VM that might not be as efficient as a UTXO based chain, but is suitable for interactive verification games. This is what the guys at Off Chain Labs are doing, and it's fully EVM compatible. Or, for instance, you can have the MoVM in an optimistic rollup, or you could have Solana's virtual machine, or you could have state rent, or you could have application specific execution stuff. Like, if you just want to do Uniswap, you can just have a Uniswap optimistic rollup. Or you can have, for instance, an EVM, but add access lists so that you can have some parallel execution. So what are we doing at Fuel and what's our design philosophy? Uh, so there's kind of three things. One of them is the UTXO data model over the accounts data model, over the EVM, uh, with a focus on stable coin payments, but it can be used to transfer any token, any ERC-20 token, and potentially any non-fungible token. And this allows you to build things like non-custodial exchanges on top of it and other applications like instant withdrawals, uh, social media networks, and so on. Uh, and we use an efficient fraud proof scheme that does not require state seri serialization. In other words, you do not have to compute a Merkle root after every transaction or even after every block, because it turns out that this state serialization operation is a huge bottleneck for Ethereum. And you know, the reason that state accesses are so expensive in Ethereum is because of the state serialization operation. And lastly, instead of allowing Ethereum style, you know, stateful smart contracts, stateful smart contracts, which are sequential in nature, we allow, uh, or we're going to allow uh, stateless predicate scripts similar to what Bitcoin has, which are much more performant because they can be executed in parallel and they don't require state accesses. So the design philosophy here and why we made these design decisions is we want a highly efficient and parallelizable execution model as opposed to the EVM, which is sequential. And this allows us to achieve things like a thousand transactions per second on consumer hardware quite easily. Uh, because, and at this point, the bottleneck for us is very much the data availability throughput of Ethereum and not client-side execution or client-side validation. And we have no state serialization. Uh, another nice property that arises from this is that because we're using these stateless predicates, you no longer really have to worry that much about gas. Uh, you know, it's the predicate cost, whatever it costs, you don't have to worry about, you know, the denial of servicing or anything. It can mostly be measured in terms of its size, but you know, you can do some other minor stuff, but the cost of a predicate is completely deterministic. Uh, so there's, you don't have to worry about gas. Uh, lastly, this, uh, this design is meta-transactional. Uh, so the roll-up block reducer pays fees, uh, pays ether fees uh, to include these roll blocks on chain, but users don't have to, uh, which means users no longer need to be exposed to the volatility of ether. Uh, they no longer need to worry about paying insane tr transaction fees in ether and so on. Uh, they can just get onboarded directly onto the roll-up, uh, use the roll-up, and then they'll be just fine, just there. So we very much optimize for maximum performance as opposed to short-term ease of use, which is what you would see, for instance, in a EVM on a, on a roll-up. Uh, you know, our, our philosophy is very much, uh, it might be a little bit more difficult to use, you know, currently nowadays, especially if you're used to like truffle, ganache, and all this other stuff, it might be a little more difficult to use fuel, but the trade-offs are a massive increase in transaction throughput without increasing node hardware requirements without increasing the cost to run a full node. So if you'd like to know more about us, uh, you can follow us on Twitter at, at fuellabs underscore. Our website is fuel.sh and we recently released our V1 fuel testnet along with uh, some, some additional things like a wallet and a live uh, fuel plays Pokemon demo that you can interact with. And our GitHub is uh, the fuel labs organization. So with that, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or us on, on Twitter or whatever. And we'll, and uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you for listening.